You know, it feels like only yesterday that I was reviewing the extremely long-awaited Final Fantasy VII Remake, a game that continues to polarise people to this very day, partly because it covered only a tiny fraction of the original game, partly because it felt more like a linear set of story events strung together by walking simulators rather than a free-roaming RPG, and partly because of the weird alternate timeline subplot that made it less of a remake and more of a bizarre sequel slash soft reboot slash multiverse of of madness clone. And yet, here we are, four years down the line, facing up to the second instalment of the remake trilogy, helpfully titled Rebirth. And I think it's fair to say that fans had a few questions about this one. Questions like, where the hell was this multiverse storyline going? Would we actually get to explore a decent chunk of the game world this time? How far into the story would it progress? And how would it handle that scene? And would we finally get to see Tifa in a bikini? Well, now that I've played it from start to finish, I can at least answer some of those questions. Others are going to be a bit more of a challenge because the central storyline has become more confusing than a particle accelerator instruction manual written entirely in Welsh. But fear not, for the drinker is here to make sense of the madness that is Final Fantasy. So suit up, because we're going in hard and fast on this one. Now, on a purely technical level, Rebirth is an absolute triumph. Far bigger and more expansive, more polished and refined, more ambitious and detailed than its predecessor ever was. It's a brilliantly vibrant and detailed reimagining of an iconic game, made with obvious respect and reverence for the world, greatly expanding on events and backstory that was only hinted at before and generally providing a much more fleshed out and complex world to explore. There's a ton of things to see and do, and even after ploughing a good 60 hours into this game, I didn't even come close to experiencing everything it has to offer. One of my big criticisms of Remake was how short, linear and intrusive it was. You were basically corralled from one extended cutscene to the next, with very limited exploration options, no ability to customise your party, and very few side missions to undertake. There were times when I just wanted to catch catch my breath, take some time out and explore the world of Midgar at my own pace, but it always felt like the story was impatiently trying to push me forwards. Rebirth is the polar opposite though. After the initial intro that gets things moving, you're basically turned loose on the world map and told, this is it, do what you want. And as it turns out, there's quite a lot to do. The world map in the original game was basically just a big animated empty space with random battles and the occasional settlement to explore. Yeah, it looked pretty enough with the simple cutesy graphics, but there wasn't a whole lot in it. The world of Rebirth, on the other hand, is fully rendered to scale, which means you can literally walk all the way across it in real time. And it's crammed full of side quests, challenges, monsters, bonus areas and treasures, not to mention all those little incidents details and bits of visual storytelling that really help to flesh out game worlds like this. It's broadly divided up into regions that you gradually unlock as you progress through the story, but each one is so big that it'll take like 10 hours to fully explore, and there's always the option to fast travel back to previous ones if you've got unfinished business there. All of this adds up to a much better sense of pace this time around. Rather than being constantly cajoled into the next story event, you feel like you've got much more freedom to do what you want. You can lose yourself for hours just wandering around, absorbing the environment, learning more about the world, fighting and levelling up, and generally doing all that nice role-playing stuff that was so lacking in Remake. That being said, some of the little irritations of modern open world game design have still managed to creep in, like all those distracting little blips that appear on your mini-map whenever you pass within 10 miles of anything vaguely interesting, trying to guilt you for not investigating all that extra stuff they put so much effort into coding, or Chadley calling you roughly every 6 minutes with another laundry list of stuff he wants you to investigate. Fuck off you little dork, I'll talk to you when I'm goddamn good and ready. Combat uses the same hybrid real-time and menu-based attack system as Remake, which was fine for me because it's pretty intuitive to pick up and use. Battles happen in real-time, so you've got the opportunity to attack, dodge and parry on the fly, but you can also pause the action to use magic, special abilities and summons if your AP gauge is full up. But it's only going to refill if you take some kind of offensive action, so you can't just spend the whole battle dodging and wasting time. And even if you could, casting magic leaves you vulnerable to enemy attacks that can disrupt your spells, so you really need to decide how and when to act. You can switch between characters during the battle to take direct control or issue instructions to them, and believe me, you'll need to become good at this to get the most out of them, because they won't do a whole lot by themselves. Leveling up just kind of happens automatically if you get enough experience, rather than letting you choose what attributes 
attributes you want to boost up, but a separate skill tree allows you to learn new abilities and attack patterns. There's only so many upgrade points available though, so you have to pick wisely and choose the skills that complement your playstyle. The Materia system allows you to pick which spells you want access to, so attaching a fire Materia to your character allows them to use fire magic, for example. Although weirdly, there's no health penalty for using lots of them like in the original game, so instead of encouraging you to be tactical and only choose the ones that are most useful, it incentivizes you to load everyone up with as much of this shit as you can fit into their Materia slots. I don't know, it just feels a bit counterintuitive to me. So really, it's an odd mix of linear character progression coupled with a magic system that favours resource overkill and a certain degree of customization in other ways. The difficulty level is pitched pretty low, you'll breeze through most basic encounters without difficulty, but some of the boss battles will test your combat and micromanagement skills. And if you really want to punish yourself, you can unlock hard mode after your first playthrough for a much more demanding experience. Graphically, I've got no complaints whatsoever. The texture problems and wonky physics that soured the previous game are long gone now. Environments are huge, beautifully rendered and generally a joy to explore, and I can't tell you how cool it is to see iconic landmarks like Junon, Cosmo Canyon and the Gold Saucer rendered in glorious 3D with current generation hardware. Settlements themselves are generally much larger, more heavily populated and more complex than the charmingly cartoony pre-rendered backgrounds of the original. They retain the same look and feel, but everything just feels a bit more grown up now. And the visuals are complemented by some beautiful ambient sound tracks that really set the mood perfectly. The Final Fantasy games have always been known for their excellent scores, and this one's no exception. And damn man, some of the battle sequences and cutscenes must be pushing the limits of the PlayStation hardware, but I've got to admit, I never noticed any glitching or frame rate drops. The cast is much bigger and more fleshed out this time around. Yuffie, Sid, Kate Sith and Vincent all join the party at various points, and while Sid and Vincent don't show up until pretty late in the game, Yuffie and Kate Sith get a lot more screen time than before. And I don't know man, whether it's the voice actor or just better writing, Yuffie's a lot less abrasive than in the original game, behaving more like a playful little sister to Cloud. Yeah, she's a bit of a tryhard and definitely needs a cup of calm the fuck down at times, but I actually found myself warming to her by the end, which is something that never happened with the original. Sid's less of a gruff, embittered old has-been and more of a dashing, smooth-talking flyboy this time around, and weirdly, he seems to have a connection to Aerith that I've either forgotten from the original game or they just wrecked conned in this time around. For the life of me though, I'll never understand why they gave Kate Sith a Scottish accent. Honestly, the one time my people get represented in this game and it's a fucking animatronic cat riding a stuffed Moogle. Kate Sith is one aspect of the original game that I would have been happy for them to either drop or massively reduce to a background character because there's times when really serious heavy shit is going down and you're pulled right out of the experience by having to look at this goofy arsehole clowning around. And honestly, the the segment where you're forced to guide him through a tedious box throwing puzzle is probably the low point of the whole game in terms of enjoyment. Slow, frustrating and crushingly dull. On a more positive note though, the core narrative very much revolves around Cloud, Aerith and Tifa, and I think they actually achieve a better balance between the main trio than they did last time. Much as I liked Tifa in the original game, she was kind of pushed into the background after Midgar and didn't really become important to the plot again until Disc 2, which was well into the story by that point. Here though, she's given a lot more to do, and there's a very interesting event towards the end that has me wondering where they're going to take her next. Let's be honest though, this is very much Aerith's game, and that becomes increasingly obvious the closer you get to the ends. Everyone knows what her storyline's leading up to, and the interesting thing is that this time around, so does she. There's a lot of pathos to be derived from a tragic heroine who knows her own fate and resolves to make the most of the time left to her before the end, and if I'm honest, the game teeters right on the brink of over-milking it. At a certain point, I began to wonder how many poignant speeches and emotional goodbyes we were going to get from this character, wringing every single drop of emotion out of the player, but what the hell. She's earned it, I think. And I have to give full credit to the voice actors here, they all do a fantastic job bringing these characters to life and investing them with so much personality and energy. Whether it's Barrett coming face to face with his devastated hometown for the first time in years, or Red 13 learning the truth of his father's sacrifice, or the friendship between Aerith and Tifa, something that was barely touched on in the original game where they mostly seem kind of ambivalent towards each other. They're basically rivals for Cloud's affections, yet they still develop this close, charming friendship 
where they genuinely seem to respect and care about each other. Jesus, if this was made by a western developer, they would 100% be gay for each other, because platonic same-sex friendships are as rare as video game journalists who don't live in studio apartments with four other people and smell of cat urine. The expanded script gives much more time to get to know the gang in so many different situations, whether they're fighting for their lives against a ticking clock, coping with tragedy and loss, or just kicking back on the beach and gloriously revealing swimsuits, and... Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Honestly, some of the most fun moments in the game are just watching the group goofing around together, sparking off each other and swapping banter as they explore some new area or tackle a new challenge. You really get the sense that this weird mismatched group of people have become actual friends who care deeply about each other, which makes it all the harder when you know they're going to have to say goodbye to some of them. And this, dear viewer, is where I'm going to get into spoiler territory, so if you don't want to know what happens at the end of Rebirth, then you might want to stop this review right now. Consider yourself warned. So in terms of the overall story, this game covers the events of the original game from Midgar all the way up to Aerith's death in the Forgotten Capital. Yeah, there's a shit ton of additional content added in there to flesh out major events, plus a few characters I could probably do without, but for the most part it pretty faithfully reconstructs all the key plot points from the original. Well, up until the ending at least. One of the most contentious aspects of Remake is that it wasn't technically a remake at all, it was more like a soft reboot of the original game broadly following the same events but deviating in some crucial places and actually acknowledging when it was doing it. The way it accomplishes this is through a system of alternate timelines that are created every time a character changes a major event from the original. But fate has a way of trying to course correct, so every time a character attempts to do this they were impeded by weird ghostly apparitions called whispers whose job it is to get things back on track. The ending of Remake made it clear that the characters had successfully defeated the Whispers, breaking the timeline and meaning that anything could happen in the next game. Shit man, the tagline for Rebirth even says, DEFY DESTINY TOGETHER. So I don't think it takes a genius to see where this was all leading, because the writers certainly weren't subtle about it. What happens to Aerith? Does she still die like in the original, or does Cloud manage to defy destiny and save her life this time around? Well, yes and no, which I realise is a frustratingly vague answer, but what can I say? It's a frustratingly vague ending. The high level view is that Cloud manages to stop Sephiroth and save Aerith, but then reality suddenly snaps back into place again and she dies just like before. But then, she's also apparently alive in a different reality and even helps out in the following battle. And before anyone chips in with the old, drink her, don't you know that Cloud's just imagining the whole thing because he can't cope with her death? To that I'd like to say, get that weak shit out of my presence. Honestly, I'm going to make a video specifically debunking retarded theories like that because they make no sense and completely invalidate what the game's trying to show us. That, however, is a battle for another day. Either way though, it creates a problem because instead of providing emotional release and closure, it leaves the audience with this weird conflicted sense of confusion. Like, I didn't quite know what to feel when the game ended because it seems like the writers were trying to cover every possible emotional base. And the more I think about it, the more it pisses me off, because I can see the tightrope they're trying to walk here, trying to appease Final Fantasy purists by sticking broadly to the same events as the original game, but also trying to make good on the narrative promise set up by the previous one. And the result is an awkward compromise that kind of satisfies nobody. Like, if you really want to go down this path of changing past events and rewriting the story to take it in crazy new directions, then at least have the balls to fucking commit to it and do something definitively different. Don't go for this weird halfway house that could mean anything or nothing, just to appeal to two groups who want fundamentally different things from your game. I mean, clearly they want to keep people guessing until the finale, and Rebirth's coda seems to suggest that all bets are going to be off in the final game, but whether or not this creative gamble pays off is all going to depend on whether they can wrap things up with a satisfying finale, and from the perspective of an outsider looking in, I don't really see how they can manage it now. Ultimately though, despite some misgivings about the creative direction they're taking it, one thing I can't deny is that this game got to me in a way that no other video game ever has. Not even the original. I was genuinely invested in the characters and their story, enjoying every minute with them, eager to see what happened next but kind of dreading it at the same time, willing certain characters to succeed against the odds even if I suspected they wouldn't, rushing towards that unknown ending but also not wanting it to be over. And once the credits finally rolled, feeling weirdly lost and bummed out, like I just experienced something truly special which I knew would never 
never be replicated. And I don't know, man. Maybe it's nostalgia. Maybe I'm just getting soft in my old age. Or maybe it's member berries or wish fulfillment. But if a game like this can warm the cold ashes of even my blackened heart, bring a lump to my throat and a manly tear to my eye, then it's got to be doing something right. And if I'm honest with you, I think Rebirth does a lot of things right. Now I just hope they stick the land in. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.